This week we are studying together Parshas Lech Lecha. If you'd like to follow along in your Chumash, I will be reading from the beginning of Perak Tesvav, Pasuk Aleph. Says the Torah, It was after these events, referring to the wars that took place first between uh, the kings of the time, known very famously as the war between the four kings and the five kings. And then after the four kings were victorious, and they took Avram Avinu's nephew Lloyd captive, Avram himself, together with his men, waged war against the four kings and was victorious over them. After these things, Hashem Hashem spoke to Avram, who, has, who at this stage is still called Avram, not Avraham. His name has yet to be changed. So the Torah refers to him as Avram without the hay. Hashem speaks to Avram Bamachaze in a vision, Lamer, and he tells him the following. Quote, Al tira Avram, he says. Don't be afraid, Avram. Anoichi Mogenlach, I will protect you. Schorcho harbe ma'oid, your reward is yet in great abundance. And of course, all the commentaries, excuse me, and right after that, Hashem continues, uh, Avram continues and says, you know, um, what is it that you're going to give me? What is it that you're going to do for me? After all, uh, all I have is Eliezer, I have no children. And Hashem reassures him that he would have children and that his children would be as many as the stars, uh, as the stars of the heavens. And then after that comes the famous story of the Brisbane Absar. But in this Pasuk, in this Pasuk, Perak Tezvav, Pasuk Aleph, where Hashem tells Avram, uh, reassures, tells him not to fear, don't worry. Hashem reassures Avram that he would protect him and, and that his reward would be in abundance. Uh, the commentaries all jump at this verse. And there's a couple of things that are confusing about it, even when you just read it on a surface level. First of all, the Pasuk seems to have no context. Um, Avram just, has just won the war. He seems to be riding high, so to speak, in the peak of his career. He saved his nephew Lloyd. He's doing everything he's supposed to. Everything seems to be going fine. Why would out of nowhere Hashem come to him and say, oh, don't worry, Avram, I'm going to protect you. What was Avram worried about? Why was he worried about it? Why does he need Hashem to protect him? More than under normal circumstances. After all, he's just won the war. The danger is over. Um, what is Avram really scared of? And, and how does this posse come in context? We're talking between the wars and the Brisbane Absalom, the covenant between the pieces. What is going on here? And then the question, the conclusion of the posse, the conclusion of the verse is Hashem tells Avram, your reward is yet in abundance. And here the commentaries are incredibly perplexed by this because why is Avram concerned about his reward? Why would he think that his reward is not in abundance? Um, why is Avram interested in, in any reward at all? More, more about that in a minute. But to answer all these questions, Rashi gives a straightforward um, and, and beautiful explanation. Rashi says like this, I'm skipping on the on, on Pasuk Aleph, I'm skipping the first few words. Rashi says, <laughs> After this miracle was performed for Avram Avinu, that Avram killed uh, these four kings, Avram was now concerned. There was a concern that came to Avram now, specifically after his miraculous victory. What, what was it? What was he concerned about? And he said to himself, Perhaps, said Avraham Avinu, now that I've experienced this victory and now that I've had this, these miracles happen for me, now Avram became worried. Perhaps I emptied my spiritual savings account of all of the brachas that Hashem had in store for me. Perhaps I already received reward for all of my tzitkas. What if there's nothing left in, re, in store for me as a reward for my avoid as Hashem, for my service of Hashem? Because after these incredible miracles that I've just experienced, perhaps I've already cashed out all of my spiritual divine equity and my reward that is coming to me. 
Kach Amar Lo Yamokim continues Rashi. That's why Hashem says to him, Al Tira Avram. Don't worry, Avram. Anoichi Mogen Loch. I will protect you. Protect you from what? What does Avram need to be protected from? Min Ha'Oynesh Shaloi Te'Onesh Al Kol Oysen Nefoshes Sheharakta. I will protect you, says Hashem, from punishment, from the Midas Adin, from the attribute of judgment. You will not be held responsible. You will not be prosecuted for those human beings that you killed in war. And this that you worried about receiving your reward, says Hashem, don't worry. Your reward is in abundance. Rashi gives as, as is Rashi's way, a straightforward, clear explanation so we can read the Posik and we can read it straight and we can understand and we can understand it in context. What was Avram Avinu afraid of? According to Rashi, two things. Number one, he was worried that he had maxed out his credit card with Hashem and that he had withdrawn as much as there was to withdraw and that he had received all the reward that was in store for him and there was nothing left. Why was he worried about it now? Why now? Because of the incredible miracle that Hashem had just performed for him, where he was able to be victorious over the four kings, over the four, basically over the four superpowers of the world, right? Here was one yidl, here was one little yid uh, with a couple of men. The, t- the Torah says he had 318 men with him, which the commentaries argue, does that mean that he actually had 318 men? Or others say, Rashi brings this, others say 318 is the gematri, is the numerical value of the name Eliezer, which was Avram Avinu's right-hand man. So it was just, according to this explanation, when the Torah says 318 men, it was really just two men. It was really just Avram and Eliezer, maybe a couple of helpers, but that's about it. Either way, whether he had 318 men or whether it was just him and, and Eliezer, either way, he faces in battle the four superpowers of the time, the four great monarchs of the time. And he's victorious over them all, clearly, miraculously. I mean, completely out of the norm. Right? The Medrash discusses very famously, how was Avram Avinu able to do this? I mean, this is kind of some kind of a joke. Whether, whether it was 318 men or whether it was just the two of them, I mean, either way, how was he able to do it? The Medrash says very famously um, that he was able to do it because a, a miracle happened, that when he faced the enemies, he would bend down to the ground, pick up from the floor clumps of earth, clumps of sand, and toss them into the air at the enemy. And miraculously, as these grains of sand would fly through the air toward the enemy, Hashem would turn them into all sorts of ammunition, bows and arrows, uh, arrows, spears, you know, uh, would be like, would be like the modern day equivalent of going to war, uh, you know, in a car. And when you have to face tanks, you pick up a clump of earth from the ground, you throw it at the tank, and it turns into a bomb in the air, and it blows up the tank of the enemy. This was clearly, you know, outer worldly stuff. And Avram won. He won the wars. So he thinks to himself, after all of these miracles that Hashem has performed for me, perhaps I've, I've retrieved, I've received all my reward and there's nothing left for me. Which goes a step further. If there was no reward left for Avram Avinu, so now he finds himself concerned that he's now vulnerable to Hashem's retribution for something that he did. In other words, if, if he has no more brachas, if he has no more protection up in heaven, then he's worried about something that he's going to be prosecuted for. What's he going to be prosecuted for? Well, it turns out he killed people in battle. This is called Oysan Nefoshis, all those people. Rashi says that, that, that Avraham Avinu killed in battle, which of course is unfortunately uh, very much a part of the war experience. People die. And people died at the hands of Avraham Avinu. So Avram is concerned, well, if I don't have Hashem's extra protection, if I'm no longer a VIP, if I've lost my VIP membership, then I'm left vulnerable to, to, to the Midas Adin, to the attribute of judgment. Who knows how Hashem will hold me responsible for the individuals who died at my hands. These are the concerns of Avram Avinu. So that's why, explains Rashi, the Torah comes right after the story of the four kings and the five kings and these wars. And Hashem says to Avram, Bahidvar Hashem, after these, these events, Hashem comes to Avram and says to him, Number one, I'll dear Avram, number one, don't be afraid. You're worried that you're going to be prosecuted. Hashem says, You're not going to be prosecuted. Hashem says, I'm going to protect you. 
you won't be prosecuted, you won't be, be hurt, you won't, be, you won't have to face a difficult day in judgment for the people that you killed. The people that you killed, you had to kill them. They were dangerous individuals. They were risking the lives of others, etc. And Hashem says, and, and in general, and, and, and then additionally Hashem adds, in general, this that you're worried about receiving rewards, or you're worried about that you've maxed out your credit card, don't worry about that either. Your reward is yet, your reward is yet in abundance. Even though Avraham Avinu, a lone soldier, a lone man, right, a lone idol, uh, overpower, overcame the superpowers of the time, clearly an incredible miracle. Nevertheless, Hashem says to him, this is not all the reward I have for you. There's much more reward left in store. And Hashem uses two expressions. Harbe, which means in, it's in abundance. Mo'oid, exceeding abundance. Hashem says, your reward is an exceeding abundance. You have nothing to fear. All right, before I go on, I have to tell you a quick joke. So I, I have to. It's not that I want to. I just, I, I push it. I have no choice. So the legend goes that there is a shul somewhere in Yerushalayim, in the neighborhood of Meir Sharon. And the shul has been around for many, many decades. And the people who come there, they come every day. Many of them are already, you know, later on in life. And it's a very comfortable shul, and it's very small. Anyways, they're sitting around one day, and they decide they don't like what the President of the United States is doing in the world. And uh, they want him to do it differently. So they look around the room. Who's going to, we have to call the President and let him know. Who's going to call the president? So they elect one Yid, you know, from the group of 15, 20 Jews who daven in this particular shtibel every day. They elect one Yid and they say, you, you call the president. You call the White House and you tell them, Mr. President, we don't like whatever it is that you're doing. Okay, I don't mean this politically. I just mean this anecdotally. So the particular Yid, let's call him Moishala. Moishala calls the White House. No. A, uh, an operator answers the phone. Hello, this is Moishala from Meir Sharon. Oh, Moishala from Meir Sharon. How can we help you? He says, I have an important message to relay from the people of Hevra Shas in Bnei Brak, and I must relay it to the president himself. They said, listen, it's not the way it works. You can't talk to the president. Moishala says, I'm representing the people of my congregation and I must speak to the president himself. It's, it's critically important, of, <laughs> of national importance, international importance. All right, it's Moishla's lucky day, and the president gets on the phone. Moishla tells the president, Mr. President, I want you to know, I represent the members of my community, and we are not happy with what you're doing. We want you to do this and that, and, and the other differently. The president says, look, Moishla, I appreciate your sentiment, I'm very busy, I gotta go. But uh, I, I heard you out, have a nice day. Click, hangs up the phone. Moishala comes back to the people of his shul, he tells them, I spoke to the president, and what did the president say? The president said he heard me, but that's it. They said, oh, no, no. You tell the president you're gonna call, you call the president back and you tell him if he doesn't listen, this little shtibel is gonna wage war in the United States of America. Anyways, he calls back the president and he threatens him with everything under the sun. He says, you know what we have in our shul? We have old talaisim, we have old challah knives, we have old challah boards, we have salt shakers that we haven't used, we have mayim achreinim that's left over from 30 years ago. We're gonna throw everything at you. And the president says, wait a second, Moishala, you, you're threatening me? You're the United States Army? Are you kidding me? We have hundreds of thousands of soldiers, we have, tanks, we have airplanes, we have ships, we have bombers, we have destroyers. What are you coming with? Me? Sugar and guns, are you coming at me with challah knives and salt shakers and my machreinim and all talesim? I mean, guns are up from cup. From the other end of the line, there's quiet. Moshe is not saying anything. The president goes, hello, Moshe, are you there? A very sheepish Moshe says, yes, yes, I'm here. The president says, have I convinced you not to wage war in the United States of America? He says, yes, yes, you have, you have. We're not going to wage war. The president says, Phew, I'm very relieved. Can I ask you, what is it that changed your mind? So Moishala tells the president, you don't understand, Mr. President. When I heard you say that you have hundreds of thousands of soldiers in your army, I figured to myself, 
How are we ever going to get enough food to feed hundreds of thousands of prisoners of war? No chance. We drop it and we drop the war. In a similar vein, I say this because it's important to understand the gravity of what the Torah is telling us happened here. Avraham Avinu, either with a couple of men or single-handedly, faced the four superpowers of the world, and he was victorious. It's an unbelievable miracle. It's an unbelievable miracle. All right, like I said, the Medrash says that the sand turned into weapons and, and, and armor and, 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 and everything he needed. But even after it was all over, Hashem reassures Avram, don't worry, Avram. You have plenty of reward and abundance, an exceeding abundance of reward in store for you in the world to come. What Rashi does not address, and the commentaries, many of them discuss this, and, and it, it opens up this verse, opens up really a very, very large discussion, some of which I want to explore with you today. What the commentaries do discuss is, is this. Why did Hashem have to reassure Avraham Avinu that there was an exceeding abundance, abundant reward for him still waiting? Why was Avraham Avinu concerned about getting rewarded for his mitzvahs? Yes, we can understand why he was concerned about not being prosecuted, yes. But why the reward? After all, a Jew is supposed to serve Hashem not for the sake of reward. A Jew is supposed to serve Hashem without any ulterior motives. A Jew is supposed to serve Hashem completely selflessly. Amazingly, when the Rambam and others talk about this idea that a person should not, a person's motivation in serving Hashem and living a godly, divine life in this world, when the, when the commentaries and halacha talks about this, the icon, the, the person that's held up as the ultimate individual who personified this more than anyone else actually is Avram Avinu. I believe the reason for that is because Avram in the entire Torah is the only one who is ever referred to by Hashem as Avram Oihavi. Avram, Hashem refers to him as Avram, my beloved or my lover, which reflects a reality in which Hashem and Avram Avinu have this relationship where they're so deeply in unconditional love that Avram is happy to do whatever it is that Hashem wants him to do without seeking any reward, without even caring about any reward. And yet here we find not only that Avram is concerned about his reward, but that Hashem is reassuring Avram Avinu. Don't worry, he tells him. You've got plenty of reward, an abundance of reward, an exceeding abundance of reward. So how is it that we go from this individual who suppose held up as the individual who doesn't care about reward, all of a sudden we find Hashem tells him, oh, there is reward and there's a smorgasbord and there is plenty waiting for you in store. Don't worry. How does this fit with the way we portray Avram Avinu always as an individual who served Hashem without, without seeking, without caring for his own reward in any way? This is a question that's discussed, an issue that's discussed here by the Zoyer and many other commentaries, and they really use this as a springboard to discuss the issue in general. How does this really work? Is it okay for a person to say, Hashem, look, I'll study your Torah and I'll do your mitzvahs, but, uh, you know, I'd really, uh, I'd really like a Ferrari. You know, is it okay for a person to say, Hashem, I'll help old ladies cross the street and, uh, you know, I'll do whatever it is that you want me to do. But, uh, hey, you know, I'd really appreciate if you, uh, you know, if you made my business flourish, if, uh, I don't know, you know, if you helped me lose 20 pounds or, or whatever it is. Are these kinds of things, are these kinds of deals okay? Is it ever okay for a person to say to Hashem, look, let's make a deal, God. I'll do what it is that you ask of me, and you do what it is that I ask of you. Is this ever okay? Or should a person always say, no, no, I don't care, whatever, let Hashem do whatever he wants. I'll do what I have to do, and, and, and that's the end of it. The Pirkei Ovis is very famously quoted as saying that a person should not serve Hashem like a servant who serves for the sake of receiving a, a, a salary or a reward. No, just do it because, because, that, because that's the truth. But again, we find that we all, we, we all do this all the time. We ask Hashem. We make deals with Hashem, etc. So this becomes the springboard here for this, for this discussion of when and in what case and in what context 
is it appropriate for a Jew to expect or to ask or to anticipate that he or she be rewarded for the avoidance of Hashem, for the service of Hashem that they do in this world? Okay. And in this vein, I want to share with you a story. Um, I may have shared this with you in the past, um, but it is, it is a very sort of intriguing story. Um, the Zoyar, actually, it's a story that's written in the Zoyar. The Zoyar shares it specifically with regard to this issue um, of serving Hashem for the sake of reward. And the story is, like many passages in the Zoyar, it's perplexing at first, but there's, there's much to think about. The Zoyar relates the following tale. There was a yeshiva, right? Let's assume this yeshiva was round about in the times of the second base Hamikdash. Okay, we're talking about 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, they had yeshivas too. And believe it or not, the yeshiva had a problem. <laughs> what was the problem? Enrollment was down. Enrollment was down. There were not enough students, uh, which of course means there's not enough funds for the yeshiva. And uh, the yeshiva is struggling. So what do you do? So you got a couple options, right? Number one, you go fundraising. Number two, you, uh, you, know, you, cut your, you cut your expenses. In this case, the Rosh Yeshiva, whose name was Rab Abba, the Gemara says, the, the Zoyar says, his name was Rab Abba. Rab Abba decided to advertise, <laughs> to invest money in advertising his yeshiva. Okay, but what are you going to say? I have a yeshiva, come and study here. There's a thousand yeshivas, or many, or many yeshivas. I don't know how many yeshivas there were in that time. So as anybody who knows anything about advertising knows, you got to find, when you advertise successfully, you got to find your niche. You got to find something where you are unique and different in order to get people's attention. So the Rosh Yeshiva of Abba went on an advertising campaign. Here was his message. He said, if you'd like to become wealthy and if you'd like to live a good life, come and study Torah in my yeshiva, study Torah here, and you will be wealthy. Oh, now this got people's attention because they figured Rav Abba, the Rosh Yeshiva, is a great tzaddik. He would, he would never lie, chas v'sholem. He would never falsely advertise his own yeshiva just for the sake of getting students if he's not genuine, if he's not serious. He's advertising that in his yeshiva, if you come and learn, you'll get, get wealthy, right? So why should I go to work every day and bust myself? Maybe I'll succeed, maybe I won't succeed. I can close my business. Go learn Torah in the yeshiva of Rab Abba. And Rab Abba promises me I'll be wealthy. Needless to say, the advertising campaign was incredibly successful and the yeshiva became full of students. Baruch Hashem. The Zoyar does not tell us how things panned out for any of these students who came to study in this yeshiva. What happened? Did they become wealthy? Did they not become wealthy? How Rab Abba dealt with them, how they dealt with Rab Abba doesn't say. With the exception of one student, with regard to one student, we know what happened. This student's name was Yoisi. Yoisi says the Zoyar heard the advertisement. He saw the flyers, right? Maybe he read about it on Facebook or something. And Yoisi decided this yeshiva is for me. And so he showed up at the yeshiva. He knocked on the door. He said, I need to speak to the Rosh Yeshiva. Rab Abba, the Rosh Yeshiva opened up. Shalom Aleichem, what's your name? Yoisi. Shalom Aleichem, Yoisi. How can I help you? He says, I want to study Torah in your yeshiva because I want to be wealthy. Rabbi Abba says to him, have I got a yeshiva for you? Shalom Aleichem. Ah, Gavaldik, you're enrolled. Mazel tov. In fact, Rabbi Abba says to him, even before he started learning, he said, we're going to change your, we're going to add some titles to your name. Instead of calling you Yoisi, Instead of just being Yoisi, you're now going to be Reb Yoisi, because he was going to study Torah. Reb Yoisi, Baal HaOyshev HaKovit, the master, the owner of wealth and honor. Smicha, right away, together with Baal HaOyshev HaKovit. And so Reb Yoisi, Baal HaOyshev HaKovit, the master of wealth and honor, sits down to study in the yeshiva. 
No, a little while goes by, says the Zayar, and you know what happened? You know what happened, says the Zayar? Absolutely nothing. Gornished. So he was learning Tyra, but there was no wealth, right? Who was it? One of the comedians said, if God is, you know, if God is out there, let him give me a sign, like making a very large deposit in, a, in, in my Swiss bank account, you know? So Rabbi Abbas, Rabbi Yossi is sitting there studying Torah, waiting for the deposit into his Swiss bank account, and Gornish, nothing is happening. Says the Zoyar, he got frustrated. He went to the Rosh Hashiva. He went to Rabbi Abba. He said, Rabbi Abba, where's my, who is the guilt? Rabbi Abba, where's the dough? Where's the jengi? Where's the pecha mecha? Where's the, uh, who's the kesef? You promised me that if I study Torah, I'm going to become wealthy. You even changed my name to Rabbi Yossi, the master of wealth and honor. No, I'm studying Torah and nothing's happening. Says the Zoya, Rabbi Abba looked, the Rosh Hashiva looked at the student, the head of the yeshiva, looked at him and said, what? You are studying Torah for ulterior motives? You are using the Torah for selfish purposes? You want to study Torah in order to accumulate wealth and honor? Feh! That's terrible, says Rabbi Abba. How dare you? Ah, chutzpah! And the Rosh Hashiva turned around and faced the wall, and he wanted to daven that this student should die. But a voice came down from heaven and stopped him and said, no, Rosh Hashiva, no, Rabbi Abba. Don't pray for the demise of this student. He's going to be a very great man and a very great leader for the Jewish people. Okay. The Rosh Hashiva turns around, tells the student, listen, you have to be patient. You have to be patient, you have to wait. I stand by my promise. You continue studying Torah, you'll get wealth and honor. You just have to wait. Okay. A little while later, says the Zoyar, a wealthy man came to the yeshiva. The wealthy man came to the yeshiva. He asked for an appointment with the head of the yeshiva, with Rabbi Abba. He sat down with him and he said, my dear Rosh Hashiva, I know you have a, a hall, a yeshiva, packed with students, right? Enrollment was up in his yeshiva. I know the place is packed. I wish I could sit and study Torah all day, but I can't. I can't. I don't have the time. I don't have the opportunity. It wasn't given to me. I don't have the education. The Zayar doesn't say exactly why he felt he couldn't study, but he wasn't able to. But I want the zechus, says this wealthy man. I want the merit of studying Torah like these students have. So I'd like to make a deal with you, he says to the Rosh Hashiv. He says to the head of the yeshiva, I'd like to make a deal with you. I will sponsor the Torah learning of one of your students. I want you to pair me, the wealthy man, up with one of your students. I will give him wealth, and I want the zechus, I want the merit of his Torah learning. He'll study Torah for me, he'll study Torah for me, and I'll give him some of my wealth. And Rabbi Abba, the Rosh Hashiva, says to the wealthy man, I got the perfect shidduch for you, perfect. I know a guy who's studying Torah and who's ready to sell his Torah for money. He's just chalashing, he's dying for it. Wait right here. He walks into the study hall. He finds the student, Rabbi Yossi. He says, my dear friends, your dreams have come true. Let's go. He schleps him into his office and they make the deal. They cut a deal right there. The man promised to give the student, Rabbi Yossi, wealth. And Rabbi Yossi promised to give the wealthy man the zechus of his Torah learning. And both were exceedingly happy. The Zayar says he even gave Rabbi Yossi, even gave the wealthy man, gave the student as a symbol that to, to solidify their deal, he gave him a golden cup, which I'm assuming uh, was once upon a time a symbol of great wealth if you drank from a golden cup. Everybody was happy. By the way, it says the Zoyar, there's a sequel to the story. After a while, Rabbi Yossi, the student who now is studying Torah and wealthy, 
the student Rabbi Yossi begins to appreciate the value of Torah. He begins to, to, to develop a taste. He, his, it starts to resonate deep within his soul. He connects to it. And he starts to think to himself, what did I do? I sold my share in Torah. I sold the merit that I have in Torah learning. I sold it for money. Money is here today and gone tomorrow. What am I doing? So he goes back to the Rosh Yeshiva. He goes back to Rabbi Abba, the one who started the whole thing in the first place. He goes back to the head of the Yeshiva and says, my dear Rosh Yeshiva, I changed my mind. I want my Torah learning back. Give me back my Torah learning. I will return the money. Says Rabbi Abba, but, but you made a deal with the rich man. But the rich man has to agree. They call back the rich man. The rich man agrees. Perhaps, perhaps Rabbi Abba found a different student with which this rich man could make the deal. Is, I don't know. But be it as it may, the wealthy, the Rabbi Yossi gives back the wealth. The student gives back the wealth to the wealthy man. He even gives back the golden cup, the Zoyar says. And the wealthy man finds a different student with whom to make this deal. And this Rabbi Yossi becomes a great leader and a great Rav and a great Rebbe and a great uh, um, teacher of the Jewish people who taught them Torah for many years to come. End of story. End of story. Now let's analyze this for a couple of minutes. Number one, the head of the yeshiva seems guilty of false advertising. If he wasn't planning to give them money, why did he advertise that they could come and become wealthy? Question number two, when they come to him and they say to him, Rosh Yeshiva, where's the money that you promised us? He wants to daven that the student should die? Why? And even if the student did do something wrong, why is the consequence for that death? And the only thing that stops him, the only thing that stops him, that stops the teacher from dying for the, from, for da, from davening for the death of the student is a voice from heaven that says, don't daven for his demise. He's going to be a great Jewish leader. Did he deserve the death penalty or did he not deserve the death penalty? What are we to make out of all of this? Okay, we're a little short on time. Here's what I want to say. There's an expression in the Gemara, there's an expression in the Talmud that says, A person should involve themselves in the study of Torah and the fulfillment of mitzvahs. Shaloy lishma means even if the motivations are not pure, even if it's for the sake of ulterior motives, it's okay. One should study Torah and do mitzvahs even with, Ill, even with, with, with ulterior motives. That's the best way of translating it. Ulterior motives. Why? <speaking in Hebrew> Through doing it for the wrong reasons, ultimately you'll come to doing it for the right reasons. <speaking in Hebrew> like in this story. Through the student learn, learning Torah for the wrong reasons, eventually he developed an understanding, an appreciation, a connection with it which helped him graduate and, and, and lift him up from, from his previous reality into a world we could, where he could appreciate the Torah for what it is. The Rambam, Maimonides, compares this. He says, you know, when you first teach a child, when you first motivate it, how do you motivate a child to start learning? You give them candies, you give them, you know, things that will bribe a child to do the right thing or to study or to apply themselves, etc. As the student grows, as the student develops, you can, you can no longer bribe them with candy. You have to find more developed ways to motivate a student. So the Rambam says some people get stuck just in more and more sophisticated forms of motivation. But really, just like you're supposed to grow out of immature forms of motivation, you're supposed to grow out of all forms of motivation, which are exterior, until you get to the real motivation, which is to study the Torah for this, and to do the mitzvahs for the sake of the connection to Hashem, for the sake of the Torah mitzvahs themselves. 
What if a person is not on that level? No problem, says the Gemara. You can study Torah and you can do mitzvahs even, even with ulterior motive. In the end, in the end, in the end, it'll bring you to the right station. You'll get to the right place. You'll study and you'll practice for the right reasons. Okay. Are there any exceptions to this rule? Are there any exceptions to this rule that a person should engage in study of Torah fulfillment of mitzvahs with ill intent? Um, at some point, do we say, no, 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 no. That, that's not what we had in mind. Your motives are too forlorn. They're, they're too far gone. They're too distant. Are there any, is there any point at which we draw the line and we say, if that's your motive for studying Torah, then please close the book and don't study. Or does it never matter? Not as long as a person is studying Torah, no matter what their motive is, it's fine. The Gemara draws the line on two issues. With regard to two things, the Gemara says, if that's your motive for studying Torah, don't study. What are the two things? Number one is called haloymed shaloy almanas lasas, which means one who studies Torah, but they study it for, for the, the, the purposes of academics alone without any intention of fulfilling what's written there. The Gemara says, if you don't understand that this study of Torah is meant to change your life, if you don't understand that this study of Torah is something that you're meant to carry with you, that's supposed to make a difference, it's supposed to affect the way you live and, 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 and teach you something to live a different life. I'll put it for you in, in, in my own crass words. If you're going to study Torah, but it's not going to make you a mitch, if you're going to stay a non-Torah person, but just study the Torah as, as academics, because maybe because you enjoy the academics, the Gemara says, then don't learn. In fact, the exact words of the Gemara are, you'd have been, if that's your motive for studying Torah, you'd be better off if you'd have never been born. The Gemara sees that as, as the ultimate abuse of Torah. Even the word Torah, by the way, means, comes from the word hayro, which means a lesson. If you, if a, not if you, if a person studies the Torah, but doesn't apply its lessons, and, and not they don't apply its lessons because it's too difficult, because they don't intend to. They're studying the Torah and all they want is just to enjoy it. Ah, it's so geschmack, it's so beautiful, this and that. that. Does it mean anything to you? Is it going to change your life? Are you going to live differently tomorrow? Are you going to at least try? No. No, the Gemara says, then, then close the Torah books and don't study. That's one. There's another one. There's another, uh, uh, there's another ulterior motive which the Gemara says we refuse to accept. We refuse to accept this. And if that's your motive, don't please don't study. And you know what that is? One who studies Torah and they use the knowledge that they have, they use the Torah that they accumulate as a platform to abuse others. It's called Loimed Almanas Lakantar. They use their own perceived spiritual high ground to then go and hurt other people in one form or another, verbally, emotionally, physically, whatever form it is. In all those cases, the, Zaya, the Gemara says, in those two cases, when you learn without intent of, of it teaching you how to live, or even worse, when you learn with the intent of inflicting pain upon somebody else through the Torah, because of the Torah, you, you, you use the Torah to equip you, to arm you with the ability to then go out in whatever form and hurt someone else. In those two cases, the Gemara says, do yourself, God, and Torah a favor. Shut the book and go play golf. You'll be better off that way. Don't use the Torah as an academic pursuit that you're going to enjoy without it changing your life. And definitely, don't use the Torah to go after other people. Those two shaloy lishmos, those two ill intents, we refuse to accept. Other than that, 
You learn Torah because you want to, because you're hoping you'll, Hashem will bless you with wealth. You learn to go that because on Torah, fine. That, that that's okay. In other words, we do tolerate. We do tolerate people who have their own spiritual struggles. Of course, we all have spiritual struggles. We do tolerate, we do accept, we do welcome with open arms individuals who, who want to become close to Hashem. They sincerely want to, but we all have our own shortfalls, of course. But the minute a person becomes, starts to use the Torah, starts to, to, to see it as a tool that they can use to hurt others or, 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 you know, or something that, 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 that they can use just to serve themselves to serve themselves without, it, without there being any humility, without me actually applying anything of what the Torah says to me to change my life, we tell you, you've gone too far. And that is, that is not acceptable. Okay. With regard to the story in the Zoyar, the commentaries say, this was, there was a disconnect between teacher and student, between what the teacher meant and, what, and the way the student understood it. The teacher advertised and said, if you want to become wealthy, come and study Torah. Meaning, what did the teacher mean? The teacher meant our yeshiva accepts students who study with ulterior motives. We do, we accept you. If what you really want is wealth, if what you really want is wealth, and you want to study the Torah because you hope Hashem will bless you with wealth, you're welcome into my yeshiva. That's how the, the teacher advertised it. The student understood it differently. And this, the student's understanding becomes clear the day he comes to his teacher and tells his teacher, comes to the teacher and says, where's my money? And the teacher looks at the student and says, wait a second, wait a second. We are not understanding each other at all. You, the student, thought that you could use the Torah to ask me for money? That I was going to promise you money? I never promised you money. The money I promised you is supposed to come from Hashem. I promised you that if you study Torah, Hashem will make you wealthy. That's okay for a person to study and say, Hashem, please reward me with wealth for the study of my Torah. May not be the highest form of study, studying Torah, but it's acceptable. But the minute the student comes to the teacher and, the, and, and you know, with an expectant outstretched arm and says to the teacher, "No, who's my guilt? Where's my money? The teacher says, wait a second. Now that you're studying Torah, now you think you have the right to make demands from me? Now that you're a Torah scholar, you're telling me what to do? Now that you've studied a couple of pages of Gomorrah, you think you're so smart that you can boss me around? Now you're giving me instructions and not making demands. That's not what I meant. I didn't invite you here to my yeshiva so that you would come and study Torah and get an inflated ego. I didn't invite you here to my yeshiva so you would study a couple of pages and start convincing yourself that everybody around you owes you the sun, moon, and stars. I brought you to my yeshiva to develop a deeper relationship with Hashem. What did you do until now when you wanted something? Until now when you wanted something, you dove into Hashem. And now you're coming to me. What have I done to you, says the teacher to the student. I've made you a self-entitled, pompous, arrogant scholar who thinks after he's studied Torah for a couple of minutes or weeks or months that everybody around him now owes him everything. Right? You know that joke? My second joke for today, how many Harvard students does it take to change a light bulb? The answer is one. He stands there holding the light bulb and waits for the entire world to revolve around him. If there are any Harvard students on this Zoom sheer today, my humble apologies. The teacher turns to the student and says, what happened to you? You study Torah for a couple of minutes. All of a sudden now, even I, the teacher, the Rosh Hashiva, the one who invited you here, now I'm your Baal Choyf, now I owe you? Oh no, said the teacher. You've made a terrible, terrible mistake in understanding this. I, never, I don't owe you anything. 
The Torah doesn't work. The Torah says the Rosh Hashiva, the Torah is not mine. I don't own it. The Torah is not yours. You don't own it. The Torah belongs to Hashem. The teacher becomes alarmed because he sees the student studying Torah and there's no humility. The Torah isn't changing him and making him a better person. The Torah is making him more entitled. So he tries to talk him out of it, but he fails. The student won't hear it. This is unacceptable, says the teacher. This is unacceptable. We cannot allow this to go on. This man can become dangerous and very dangerous. Because a learned person with an inflated ego is always more dangerous than an ignorant person with an inflated ego. Let me say that again and you can quote me on it. A learned person with an inflated ego is always more dangerous than an ignorant person with an inflated ego. Because at least if the person is ignorant, somebody can burst the bubble of his ego and say, you're ignorant. And the person will know it's true. But when the person with an inflated ego is also learned, oh, then he has justification for his inflated ego. What do you mean? I demand that everybody bows down to me because I'm such a big scholar. Whew. Beyond the pale, says the teacher. No. This has got to end. This is, this is very dangerous. This man can be destructive. Wait till the end of the story. But, says the Zayar, that's not the end. In the end, in the end, Hashem tells this Rosh Yeshiva, although under normal circumstances you would be right, in this case you're wrong, this student is going through a particularly painful challenge because he has particularly great potential. This student is going through a particularly difficult challenge because he has a particularly great potential. Give him more time, you'll see, you'll come around. Study, let, let him study more, you'll see the Torah will, will win him over and you'll see a great Jew will emerge. So he's granted more time and the neshama, the soul within this person, within the student, eventually makes its debut, it emerges and it pushes the arrogance away and it pushes the materialism away and the true spiritual giant emerges. There's a deeper meaning in the words of the Gemara. The simple meaning of it is, through studying with ill intent, you'll come to study with the right intent. But there's a deeper meaning. The word mitoich can also mean the depths. In the depths of the Jew, in the depths of the individual who may be misleaded and misguided by outside motives, by outside, by, by materialism, by, by, by the bells and whistles, by stuff. Mitoich, inside that Jew, deep inside, deeper than the ulterior motives, is a Jew, is a soul that's waiting to come out and serve Hashem for the right reason. One more point. What about the money? <laughs> what about the money? Does that mean that everybody who, who studies Torah, Lishma, without, without ulterior motive, that every, every one of them has to be poor? Does that mean that it's not okay to have both? What if, what if a person has been blessed by Hashem with opportunity to be successful in both areas? What if I can have it both? In the words of the Gemara, Torah Ugdullah, what if I can have the Torah study and the wealth? Is that okay? Well, of course it's okay. But here the mindset of the Jew, the mindset of the individual becomes even more important. And the ultimate paradigm for this actually is Avram Avinu. You see, my dear friends, Avram Avinu was an incredibly wealthy man. Didn't start off that way. Started off as a Jew in debt, but he became incredibly wealthy. He made his money one way or another. But his wealth never got to his head in a negative way. 
You know why? Because every step of the way, he saw his wealth. He saw it as a crucial and integral part of fulfilling his mission in this world. Every dollar he made, every animal he amassed, every servant or maidservant was another tool that Avraham Avinu had to do his mission in this world. What was Avraham Avinu's mission in this world? It was to teach all of humanity about one Hashem. Avraham Avinu's job was to go around the world and tell everybody, hey people, there is a God up there, Shema Yisrael Hashem Alekeinu Hashem Achod. And he knew that the wealthier he was, the more successful he'd be. He knew that if he went around as a wealthy, successful individual and told the people of the world, there is a creator, there is a God up in heaven who created everything. Throw away your idols and believe in one God. He knew if he did this as a wealthy man, he would be successful, much more successful than he would be if he did it as a pauper. Because if he did it as a pauper and walked around, no matter how eloquent and brilliant his speech would be, everybody would say to him, if your God is so great, why doesn't he provide you with some form of parnosa? Why doesn't he help you out? So yes, Avraham Avinu was wealthy. But he didn't serve Hashem for the sake of wealth. Quite the contrary. He amassed wealth in order to serve Hashem. And he saw every part of his wealth as an integral part of serving Hashem. So at some point when Avraham Avinu becomes concerned, perhaps I've received all of my reward for my tzidkas, for my mitzvahs. How do I know if Hashem is going to continue rewarding me? He's afraid. Why? Because he wants the money? Absolutely he wants the money. Why does he want the money? Because he's materialistic? God forbid. Avraham Avinu served Hashem without any ulterior motives. So why is the money so important to him? Because the money is an integral tool in doing what it is that he needs to do to serve Hashem. He needs to be a successful, wealthy man in order to make a Kiddush Hashem, in order to travel around the world, north, south, east, and west, like the Torah describes, and go everywhere and scream Hashem Echad. And wherever he goes, he needs them to roll the red carpet for him and give him the microphone so that he can influence people as Avraham Avinu did. In that sense, Avraham Avinu is not just an icon, but he's a teacher to all of us in terms of having a healthy perspective. What do we mean when we say a Jew should serve Hashem not for the sake of reward, that a Jew should live a poor and impoverished life? God forbid. All Jews should be wealthy, and all Jews should be successful, and all Jews should be healthy, and all, Jew all Jews should be successful in all of their endeavors. You know what Avraham Avinu taught us? Avraham Avinu taught us that every bit of that success, that every element of it, that every, every part of our lives and our cars and our bank accounts and our clothes and everything can all be used to make a Kiddush Hashem. Wherever we go in the world, whatever we do, when we do business, when we interact with people, when we buy, when we sell, when we drive in the street, we can live our lives like Avraham Avinu, where people point to us and say, look, there's a Jew who believes in Hashem. And Hashem has rewarded them. And Hashem has given them a life that is healthy and that is productive. Yes, it's okay to serve Hashem. It's okay to serve Hashem and be wealthy. It's okay to serve Hashem and be successful. It's not okay to serve Hashem in order to be wealthy. It's not okay to serve Hashem in order to be successful. It's the other way around. The success teaches us, helps us, facilitates us serving Hashem. The wealth can be used to make a Kiddush Hashem. The power, the positions that we have, the things that we do can elevate us to a position where the world takes us much more seriously than the world would without that success. And that platform we can learn from Avraham Avinu can be used to make this world a better place. Money is power, someone once said. Well, I don't know if that's true or not, but mindset is definitely power.
and having the right mindset, understanding that all the brachas Hashem has given us in life can all be used to do good things with them, makes us a healthy receptacle, makes us a healthy keli, makes us a healthy avenue for Hashem to direct all of these brachas. And please God, like Avram Avinu was blessed and Hashem promised him, your reward, your reward is, 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 in, is in excessive abundance. Excessive abundance. Why excessive abundance? Hashem couldn't find anybody else that he was more eager to give money to than Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu would never get spoiled. Avram Avinu would never get selfish. He would never become self-centered. He would never become insensitive. Quite the contrary. The more he was blessed with, the more of a kiddush Hashem he made, the more he taught the world successfully to recognize the existence of Hashem and to humbly acknowledge that Hashem runs the world. Avram Avinu is our father, our ancestor. This becomes the greatest lesson that he's taught us. We toich shaloy lishma ba lishma. Rather than serving Hashem for the sake of receiving some ulterior reward, we dive into Hashem. Hashem should bless us with all of these blessings. They can all be used, every one of them can be used to serve Hashem in a healthy, beautiful way and make a kiddush Hashem. Have a wonderful Shabbos.